is the Bay Area Book Festival's Virtual Fest, and you are listening to the Queens of Mystery. We are speaking today with Meg Gardner and Rachel Housel Hall. My name is Lori King. Meg Gardner is the internationally best-selling author of 15 novels. Her first book in the Evan, Evan Delaney series, China Lake, won the best paperback original Edgar in 2009. Then she's done four more and four in her Joe Beckett series, three standalone novels, and three in the Unsub series, the most recent of which is The Dark Corners of the Night. Somehow, Meg has also found time to be the current president of Mystery Writers of America. Rachel Housel Hall is the multiply nominated, critically acclaimed author of eight novels, four in the Detective Lou Norton series and four standalones, most recent, uh, recent of which is they all fall down, which garnered the kinds of glowing reviews that makes it hard to wear a hat for a while. My <laughs> name is Lori R. King, and I am the author of 28 novels and a heap of other things. I am currently president of the NorCal chapter of Mystery Writers of America, and I should note that this discussion with two queens of mystery is sponsored by MWA. Meg lives in Texas, so she belongs to our Southwest chapter, and Rachel's a member of the SoCal chapter, although all of us have ties to Northern California. I'm a third-generation native. Meg did her law degree at Stanford, and Rachel studied English and American Lit at UC Santa Cruz. Go slugs. Yay. And all three of us are involved with the Mystery Writers of America handbook that'll be coming out next year. So I'm talking with these two queens of mystery, about crime writing in general, but also specifically about two books, Dark Corners of the Night is the third, can, I, can you get that there, uh, third in Meg Gardner's unsub series about FBI behavioral analyst Caitlin Hendricks and her team of agents and analysts who go after serial killers. They all fall down, a standalone, is Rachel Housel's Hall a very modern take on Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, in which ferocious mom, Miriam Macy, gets what she thinks is a chance at a big prize in a reality show competition on a private tropical island, but which ends up being something very different indeed. Now, in crime fiction today, strong woman is almost a given. But in these books, Rachel with your protagonist, Mimi and Meg, especially with a key supporting character, Maya Cathcart, you've written women who are less strong than desperate because they're protecting their children. What is it like to put yourselves in the skin of a mother facing the kind of terror that arouses pure, frantic rage? Hmm. And did you give yourself nightmares? Meg, let's start with you. I don't give myself nightmares because as the author, I can turn this stuff on and off. My job as a suspense novelist is to give my readers nightmares <laughs> in the, most, <laughs> in the yeah. most entertaining way possible. I mean, as an author writing a novel, we want to give readers an emotional, immersive experience um, of the story. Of course, to write a character who is facing down a life and death scenario in in my story maya faces uh, a killer in the dark of the night in her uh, in her own home you do have to try to put yourself in that person's um shoes or in this case bare feet as she's trying to make no sound on the the hardwood floor knowing that her husband's out in the house somewhere and her her baby is uh, tucked in tucked in the nursery so you try to buckle down and think of an experience where it has seemed uh, shocking in the middle of the night, where you're disoriented, and how to put, turn that to the page for, for something that will go from um, fragments of thought, uh, disorientation, feeling like you don't know what's going on, to where you're denying what's going on, to what you, when you have to finally face, this is actually happening. And that's when the story gets interesting because that's when the character has to make a choice. What are they gonna do? 
Yeah. That's what uh, that's what that's what a story is about. The, the choices characters make under dreadful pressure. Well, in a thriller, because it's generally life and death. I mean, um, Maya's a mom. She her house is being attacked by the the villain in the story, the Midnight Man, who's a home invasion killer, and she's behind a shut door in her own bedroom. So her choice at this point, obviously, at the barest uh, basic is. You know, she could just open the window and jump out and run away. Yeah. But uh, the choice that uh, she knows, that's uh, the choice that confronts her, and that's not what she does. So I will leave it at that. I love the, I love the idea of it getting interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, of course. <laughs> Rachel. I, I would say um, yeah, part of it is being a novelist and, you know, this is a story and shutting it down. But I know I tap into... Um, being a mom. And when I was writing They All Fall Down, my daughter was just turning into a teenager. And there were, you know, the mean girls, although they're not many, they're still, you know, not being invited to a party or somebody saying something about your hair. There's all these, you know, girl things that she was starting to become involved in. And my natural, you know, I want to get them back type of retribution thing, I had to dial back you know, that feeling. Um, so I tapped into that. And I also, you know, reading um, Meg, your your book, it struck me that scene with Maya, because first my daughter's name is Maya, spelled the same way. And oh my gosh. <laughs> also, uh, when she was three years old, so that was 13 years ago, um, someone came into our house while we were sleeping. And I didn't realize that he was in our den, which, you know, was just around the corner going through our stuff. And I looked out of our French door windows and I see a man leaving with all our stuff. And I hop out of bed and scream, someone's in our house. I go grab my Maya. My husband jumps up with a machete that we keep under the bed and run out. I call 911 and the helicopter's here within three minutes. And, uh-huh. you know, that, that scene and that, protecting my daughter more than anything, it just comes over you. And that's why that scene in particular, it really stuck me and stayed with me because before becoming a mom, I didn't, you know, you, you have these hypotheticals in your mind, but it isn't until you're there and uh, you know that you would do anything for this kid that leads you running into the street with a machete or on a tropical island in off of Mexico because you've gone a little too far protecting your kid. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So just you That's- telling that story right now, I mean, like the, the hair on my, the back of my neck was standing up. I just, I mean, that, yeah. that, that got to me. Thank, thank God for the machete. I'm just, oh my gosh. <laughs> I was really, really tense until you said there was a machete. <laughs> yeah. We keep a machete, but he left his footprint on our, our armchair. And, <sighs> and for the longest I couldn't, I didn't want to wipe it away, but no, I didn't want to sit in the den for a long time either. But yeah, it was one of those uh, strangers in our house. How did he get in our house? And mm-hmm. what if I'd gone downstairs and, there he is. What would have happened to us? Right. So, you know, all those things, you know, you, as, a, as a novelist, we take all those types of experiences and infuse them into our stories and they become, yes, stories, but there's something more. And as a writer, you had no idea. We've known each other forever. <laughs> and never knew that. No, because we're always saying hello at a conference or something. We never actually get the chance like this to sit down yeah. <laughs> from yeah. a thousand miles apart and talk. <laughs> I know it had to take a pandemic for us. Right. <laughs> but thinking about now where you draw from to, to pull out a scene like that. I mean, some things you need time to process before you can really write about them in a way that's not going to make you relive it. Yeah. But um, you have to you have to judge as an author what how deep you can pull from yeah. from your own basement, as Stephen King calls it, to to to, to get the material. But I know, I mean, I've got three kids. I know um, my mom still, I think she still keeps a list of everybody who was mean to me in third grade. <laughs> <laughs> it never goes away. It's like Arya Stark. Voodoo dolls. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but even, even Caitlin, you know, she doesn't have a, a child, but 
the way she connected with with Hannah was maternal like. I mean, even more than than Rainey, who probably had her own thing going on, thinking about her kids and getting back to them. Mm-hmm. But I think that's in in many ways our our characters have this need to take care of someone or something or get back at someone for doing something wrong. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. I Even mean, their detriment. yeah, <laughs> Miriam, well, yeah, Miriam and Caitlin both find uh, <laughs> ways to do things to their detriment for <laughs> supposedly the best of reasons, but yeah. uh, and very, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where to pitch our conversation because you and I have read these are each other's novels and I could just sit down and like, ask you every single inspiration for every spoiler, but I don't think that everybody else who's watching probably wants. Right. Well, let's talk about picks, Lori. <laughs> well, you know, to go, to go from the, the very finest, that, that maternal emotion and, you know, somebody, somebody in your den, which is so yeah. deeply creepy. I'm going to have dreams tonight um, <clears throat> to go into the, the bigger, the bigger picture here, the opposite direction. People talk a lot about, placed as character people who write a, a character the place is so so vivid that it might as well be a character but in your books the um you also use place as a sort of stage it's there's with the setting and the lighting and the both the limits and the implications of that specific stage that locks your characters into a certain mood and a certain set of possibilities action and actions so why did you choose your book's place? Rachel, this isolated tropical island, and Meg, this vast sprawl of Los Angeles. And, and on this stage, how could you feel it shaping the story as you were writing? Should we right. start with Rachel this time? Um, the story starts in Los Angeles. I'm a native of, of L.A. Yay, L.A. And so all my stories tend to start there and it's this big sprawling place where things happen and you have no idea what's happening, you know, next door. And I wanted to take my characters to a place that, you know, Angelinos especially always frequent and that's Mexico. And while we think we know it, we don't really know Mexico, but we do. It's far, but it's close. So I want it somewhere, you know, far away and close enough I wanted a place where we think we know what we're doing when we're over there and we have no idea because we're arrogant Americans. Um, I wanted somewhere exotic, but you know, so, somewhere where we'd all want to go. And it wasn't, um, well, actually I named one of the chapter headings purgatory. So I wanted this in between place. And when I read Meg's book, she called it, you know, it was, it's called liminal space. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's exactly, it's a, it, this island is purgatory. It's a place that you rest in between two other firm places. So for Miriam and the other six, you know, their points of origin for Miriam, that's Los Angeles. This island is that liminal space, that purgatory. And then the end space is what happens and where they go after, you know, they're punished for their sins. So I found that, it was really creepy reading that Meg and making those connections that our books on the face seem very, very different, but we're just talking about the same things. Yeah. Mine is mostly set in Los Angeles and Caitlin and her team are brought in from Quantico from the FBI, um, you know, the, where the BAU is headquartered at Quantico, Virginia uh, at the request of the LAPD to join a task force uh, to try to identify a home invasion killer who was attacking the Southland, uh, who calls himself the Midnight Man. He um, he attacks couples, parents, doesn't harm the children other than leaving them alive with the with the trauma of knowing that their parents have been gotten rid of in the next room. But somewhere as I was doing all the research for this, I, I mean, LA is so vivid and it's got such a surface and it's, you know, got this aura and atmosphere and the sunlight. I mean, I lived there when I practiced law and um, it's just, you know, it's, it's big, it's loud, it's shiny. Um, so it, it has this, I, this image of that it's a thing, but liminal space is the borderland. It's the, it's the twilight zone. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the place where um, things are in between. And that can be 
a, a highway, an airport, a hotel, uh, um, a literal border, the, the, the time right before you drop off to sleep when you're sort of uh, in between waking and dreaming. Again, it's purgatory. So I realized that I wanted to have the, the killer use all these spaces in Los Angeles. He, what, is, what does he do that's iconic? He, he drives the freeways. Yeah. That's, uh, that's how he has managed to keep from, um, from being associated with a particular neighborhood because LA is just, you know, uh, infested with all these roads and he uses them as his, uh, as his entry and exit. And of course, while he's on them, he's nowhere. As Caitlin realizes at one point when she has to stop on the freeway and get out of the car at an interchange. And she realizes how disorienting it is to be the one, <laughs> the one thing that's not moving in this, yeah. in this rushed space. So it takes him a while to figure out how the, how the killer is using this, this seam in Los Angeles to keep himself invisible. It's funny because I take Miriam exactly from that space from Los Angeles where it's big and neighborhoods and everything is there and put her, I put her on this tiny island where, you know, you think she'd feel like maybe not as disoriented, but it's wildly disorienting for her because, you know, the island is doing things to people that she never thought it would be. This beautiful house that she covets, you know, we, we all go to Zillow and it's like, oh my God, look at that island. Oh, look at that house. And she's in this place that should make her happy. And it's, quite the opposite. It's trying to kill her. And she escaped a city that, you know, everyone thinks, so, you know, LA is trying to kill them. But here on this island, it's actually happening. Right. And I think, I mean, the put, putting it in Mexico, there's another thing I think that really, that, that reinforces um, her sense of isolation, because Mexico is, it, it is a lure. It's the place you go to get away. Get away. But you do now need to have a passport there and you are in a foreign country where they were, you know, different languages spoken and yeah. you are not on your home ground and you are real. you are the alien there. Yes. And exactly. um, so yeah. it, it just, it adds a, another level of uncertainty to, uh, to everything that's going on. But again, right. in the yeah. best way. <laughs> <laughs> Although, although even some of your characters, Meg, in in the book, um, you know, are, are not native Angelinos, and so they come out, and they uh, takes them a little while to realize exactly how how LA is made. Right. Well, Caitlin Hendricks, who's the protagonist of the series, she's uh, a Northern Californian. She is, was born, raised, regards her heart as belonging to the Bay Area. So naturally, she has a, a bit of an attitude about Los Angeles that she can't <laughs> I don't know help. What you mean. No matter how she she, she's she there to try to number. save everybody, but she can't <laughs> help herself at saying, well, you know, in Berkeley, we wouldn't do it this way. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody who in, on her team who's who's there is is not is not a native, and it's supposed to be a little bit disorienting for them as well. Which yeah. is again, fine. And of course, you also have the different worlds of this FBI team and the local police, and the divisions within the local police, and and those the sort of ongoing. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's such a such a cliche to say that you would have the, the, the warring tribes among the various law enforcement agencies. I didn't really want to have that, but I did want to indicate that this is they're handling this huge case that is swamped, uh, you know, two major law enforcement agencies so to the point where they have called in the FBI to 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 give them an additional perspective. But at some point in the story, Caitlin realizes that, uh, well, number one, it is the, the locals, it is the locals um, investigation that she and her team, they could not take it over even if they want to. It's not like the feds writing up and saying, okay, you know, this isn't diehard. They're not going to say, you know, <laughs> the FBI is here now because they are invited guests. Another but, great LA story. Right. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason that, that so many of the, the local investigators are on edge is that this is their home. 
they <laughs> their their um, you know their turf is being attacked. Their families are in danger, and uh, so they, it's all extremely um, um, unsettling for them on multiple levels. So, mm-hmm. what, what I liked about um, your story and what I try and infuse in, in my stories, LA is just it, it's as much a hometown to to those of us who live here as Omaha, Nebraska. You, right. There there is quiet here. There are neighborhoods here. And for Miriam, you know, her her leaving there for this supposedly better space, you know, she can't wait to get across the Sea of Cortez again to get back right. to, you know, this little ghetto where she now lives because she is divorced, but she yeah. she loved to get back to that space, that 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 neighborhood where she mm-hmm. sees herself as the 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 witch who eats children, you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk for just uh, tell everybody else a little bit more about the story, or do you want to let let them go and dig into it themselves? Because I it's think, such, uh, yeah. such a great idea. She she's Miriam is recently divorced, and she's having some um, legal problems because she stepped over the line some or completely, depending on your point um, of view, when defending her daughter. And she has this opportunity now to make money by going on like a big brother type reality show, she thinks. And so she heads over with six other people thinking that she's going to win this money that she needs to fight for her, uh, 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 this case that she's been, uh, not necessarily arrested for, but is being sued for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's all I'll say. Okay. Shenanigans and and shenanigans, shenanigans. Shenanigans, Yeah. So, so when you're doing world building, um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of world building in a, in a standalone and in a series, there's a kind of long-term character arc that often comes into play. Um, both of those require a certain amount of backstory and, and, I, I notice that you both write series and standalones. Uh, I mean, I I think that it's some some of us write numerous series. Which ha- at what point do they become standalones? <laughs> series, I don't know. But so when you're writing either a series or a standalone, how do you make use of your character's past? How do you choose how much to reveal? How much to, if you're doing a series book, remind readers? of what came before, or if you're hoping to bring in new readers, um, give them enough to fill in the blanks without dumping a huge info dump on them. Talk a little bit about backstory for your characters. Um, Either of you, Rachel? Um, It it was different writing the standalone after writing for Lou books. Um, For me, I would say procedurals are a little easier because I have this set world for her and I discover new parts about her um, with every new book, but I still have that foundation of who she is, um, what she does for a living, uh, not even what she believes because she questions what she believes with every case, what she thought she knew or what she thought she loved and and craved. Not necessarily. Um, So, but there was still some foundation there. For, for Miriam, I used, um, it's basically the seven deadly sins are what the characters are. And so I relied on my, uh, my history growing up in the church, my history of being an English American literature major and reading Dante's Inferno and the Canterbury Tales and my, my, my love of movies and watching seven that uh, with, with uh, and Brad and Morgan. So all of that kind of helped me form who Miriam and the others were. Um, and then me being a mom also kind of helped inform who she, she was. So even though, you know, there's this new woman in my life, I still had, I still sought and found some structure um, for her backstory that, you know, you're right. You don't want to just dump all this stuff out. And so I tried for each of my characters um, to uh, pull out why they were on the island and make it, I made it, um, I made their backstories into news stories, news clippings. 
And that was my way of kind of giving some information in a formal way, but I tended to, you know, other than that, sprinkle it throughout the story. Yeah. Yeah. I love writing series. I love writing standalones. Um, you love writing. I love <laughs> writing. Yes, but uh, but you do find the work falls in different places with each. I mean, with the first book in a series, you are building the entire world from scratch, the same as you have to do in a standalone. Uh, after that, um, a bit of it, you know, it's it, it it moves along to the to the next book as well. You don't have to decide exactly who. Caitlin's mother is because people have met her. You don't need to to know explain exactly where she grew up because we already know that we know who her best friend is. We know that her dad was a cop, which is why she has gone um, into law enforcement herself. And so you have all of that um, already established. The, the trick is to create a new story on that foundation that moves al- moves it along just enough that everything can feel fresh and familiar at the same time. It's like they always joke about Hollywood, give me give me something new exactly like we've seen before. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, so you, you want the characters to grow, but they can't become a completely different person. I mean, with a standalone, it, it, often it's because you have a, the, an idea for an amazing character and a huge hook for the story that, that is going to affect their life, and certainly in a thriller, generally in a very limited um you know, period of time. Right. So they might be very different by the end because of what they've gone through, but uh, then their story's over. You don't necessarily have to worry about what's going to happen five years down the line for them. So in a, in a series, you do need to give your character a past, um, a bit that you can explore a bit at a time, sometimes over a number of books. And you also have to give them a future. You have to give them something that... Um, a goal that they that they want, that at least they think they want, something to reach for, or a a problem that remains unresolved over right. the course of several several books, and you don't have to have that all worked out in your head when you start. I mean, um, people say, "So, do you know how the series ends?" I said, "I don't even know how this chapter ends." So, <laughs> <laughs> and I do want to comment. So, the Utah, you said that um, you found writing the new Lou Norton procedurals easier in a way yeah. because there's a certain structure to that. When you said that, I realized that the unsub books are the first novels I've ever written where the heroine is in law enforcement. All my other books yes. have had people who are sort of in the legal world, but adjacent but to it. They're yeah. either a lawyer, journalist, a consultant to the police on you know forensic psychology, or they're um, on the run from the, the police. Or, right or helping somebody out. And I was trying to figure out why I I finally realized, of course, if I want a series that's really going to have legs, it's good to give someone a job that (laughs) crime (laughs) because she's until human nature changes, she's not ever going to be out of work. (laughs) And I'm wondering whether I haven't have a subtle (laughs) issue with authority or I just didn't want to do the research. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, there there is a lot of research and there are a lot of rules. If you're writing a, a a very realistic character, and I find Caitlin realistic, I hate when you know I read about women and even black women snapping back at their sergeants and things like that. It's like that's not real. I mean, you can, <laughs> but there are repercussions yeah. to your attitude, and we don't get to do those things that men do. Mm-hmm. So right. when I read it, it's like, whatever, okay. <laughs> but Caitlin was very, I, I liked her a lot. She knew when to step back and to shut up. Well, good. It took her it took her a few times at first because, yes, yeah, she, she did think that, you know, she, she knew more than some of the people who had been there, you know. And they put her in her place. And yes, that's how it happens, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Somebody comes in your comes to you, some little law associate who just got out of school, mm-hmm. you know, last year and took the bar. She's, she may think she's, hot, you know, hot stuff, but you're certainly going to say, um, girl, you need to sit down. Yeah. That's social media. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> it's Twitter. For all this interviewing. That's right. So, so when you're writing all these different things, ranging from police procedurals to thrillers to, to, to sort of PI type things, what, 
what sort of thing feels most natural to you? I mean, you, you remarked um, that some were easier because they didn't have research. Right. But what what kind of writing feels feels more natural to you personally and which kind is a challenge and, and is fun to meet because of a challenge? Right. For me, um, I love dialogue. So dialogue is something that just comes to me quicker because I like sitting and listening to people. I like uh, how people shave their words or shape their meaning and, you know, there's subtext under there, underneath there. I eavesdrop a lot. <laughs> so I, I like hearing the rhythm of people speak. I guess that's one reason I like Elmore Leonard's writing a lot mm -hmm. because there's that rhythm of, of speech and people spitting mm -hmm. words at each other and not listening to each other. Plot is a little harder for me because I just like hearing people talk and it's like, okay, now what are they talking about? For a book, <laughs> it has to have a point. <laughs> yeah, there is that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I love writing dialogue, and I think it probably started out with Elmore Leonard as well, or watching the Rockford Files or something. That my first wow. book that I attempted to write was going to be some kind of a a sting sort of you know caper novel, and I thought it was just going to be perfect because all I had to do was just write chapters of banter, just yeah. tell these people just great characters, and they were just going <laughs> at each other, and I was just cracking myself. <laughs> and I, I got like 65 pages in, and then I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> but, so. <laughs> I had like I had the characters walk into the middle of the street and, and a set of headlights came on and raced at them. And then like that was literally the end because I'm like, I have no oh. idea who, who's behind the headlights or why on earth they're after these people. And of course, I was like the chipmunk in the headlights myself, just <laughs> frozen in the road. So it took a while to learn that you have to have a story that they are actually talking about. The dialogue is just so great because it's conflict by another by another means. Yeah, it's, like you said, it's everything that is is not being said as as much as what is being said. Yeah. Especially in a mystery, that makes it so much fun for the reader to try to figure out what is actually going on. Right. I I would say for for me, um, I since I like dialogue so much, whenever I read a book with great descriptions, that's when I feel like a hack. Like I remember reading all the light you cannot. All the light I cannot, you cannot see. What was mm -hmm. that? You know that book. Yeah. And it, it was just beautiful. Just these descriptions of, and and I'm like, I can't do this. How do you do this? And, you know, that's one reason I don't read a lot of really good books when I'm writing, because that's the last thing I need is like, I can't write like that. Like, oh. I need to just stop. So I'm, I'm working better on my, you know, on my descriptions. Okay, good. You know, I know what you mean. The last book that happened to me with was um, uh, Bluebird, Bluebird by Attica Locke. Oh, yeah. East Texas and the Texas Ranger is Ooh, in this little tried. town. And yeah, and there's a scene where he needs to interview a waitress at this redneck cracker yeah. biker bar. And he's waiting out in the back when she comes out on her break, smoking a cigarette. And he tries to talk to her and there's just a line. He says like, she, she smoked like she could tell time by nicotine. Yeah. So I, like, I went like, Oh God, I put the book down. And my husband's like, what's wrong? Don't you like it? I like, what's wrong is me. I'll never write this. <laughs> so <I'm> like that. <laughs> Why can't I write that? Yeah. 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 In other words. Books that just convince you you should give up today. Yeah. yeah. But we're yeah. not going to do that because we yeah. can always aspire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, because plot is hard, because research is difficult, and because so many people are doing other things, if you had a chance to write a book that was anything, any kind of book at all, and you, you know, you didn't have to worry about it selling, just, just, just assume that you had some, you know, somebody who promised to put it on the bestseller list, even if you didn't choose what is saleable. Um, what, what would that book be? What would you really love to write one year if you didn't have to worry about anything? Mm. I would love to rewrite um, Rebecca. <laughs> rewrite, yes. 
but with, of course, a, a, a black woman as Rebecca, and probably on the East Coast where, you know, I've never seen snow fall from the sky. So I've seen it on the ground, but to, I've never seen it fall from you the sky. You are such an Angelino. I, I really am. I tried. I've been to places and they're like, oh, it's supposed to be snow, snowing right now. I wonder why it's not. It's like, well, because I'm here. It, it can't snow. <laughs> And so I would love to once again place that character in a in another place where everything's foreign to her, the quiet and the cold and the snow and these big houses where there no there's no one else around just to see what she'd do and you know, the, the type of man she'd fall in love with or think she's in love with. So yeah, I think I I think I wanna do that. I don't know how yet, but <laughs> Give me some time. Read that. We're, we're in the house for, you know, another 20 years and I think I'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> you, Meg? You, you have Maya stand up and like, and like shake downy flakes. So <laughs> 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 you can pretend <laughs> like it's in the refrigerator and just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would probably go berserk and try to write. Uh, well, this, this is, this is guaranteed in your very, want that this is going to turn out to be perfect Absolutely. right it would be a um a, a techno politico thriller with a comic subplot that's got some kind of like um <laughs> international implications and a, a ticking clock and you know somebody has to cut the blue wire and expose the traitor <laughs> in the in in the joint chiefs of staff uh, uh and then she has to jump out of a plane and save her mother and um oh so like the scott the scott Ger Ger what's his name gerard the angels have fallen or those that, that uh, <laughs> gerard butler the yeah, gerard the, butler movie that's only, what she only 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 they'd be it'd be good so sorry <laughs> so so none of you want to write romances? Neither of you want to write romances or magic wands? Why do you think that the one I write wouldn't be a romance? No. A romance and ticking clocks and red and blue blue wires. <laughs> yeah, see, and mine is, you know, following a man to a place where there's snow and living in a big, big house that makes noise. That, that can be magic. <laughs> okay. okay. So watch... <laughs> <laughs> what watch these pages you guys <laughs> so um let's I, I wonder about if we can get back to the idea of dread because we've talked about that on and off <clears throat> how do you craft dread in your story um the books that th these two books that we're talking about are both about serial killers. Um, Meg is knows about it from the beginning. Rachel, yours is a gradual reveal, but not a surprise to anyone who picks up the book and reads the blurb. Um, one of the things that you need to do in the course of a serial killer novel is to make use of each stage as a way of stir stirring up fear in the reader of increasing dread. What are the tools that you use for that? Meg, you want to talk about that? Well, this is a case where I actually did draw a little bit from my own memories uh, in a very attenuated way. All the novels in the Unsub series have some kernel of fact as their point of origin. So I wanted to kind of ground them in something that that is actually has has actually happened. So uh, each book in the series has has had a connection to uh, a fictionalized version of uh, of real crime, of true crime, a real case. Unsub uh, had a, a taste of the Zodiac, and the Dark Corners of Night um, has uh, sort of echoes of the the Night Stalker. Uh, who was a home invasion killer who wreaked havoc in Los Angeles uh, and Southland oh. in, in the 80s. Yeah. And I lived in Southern California at the time. And I remember the feeling of dread that we all experienced because it's, uh, I mean, here we were and supposedly living in paradise, sunny days, uh, you know, summer afternoons, and then the sun goes down. And this guy owned the night 
and nobody could see him for like 15 months. Nobody could identify him. Nobody knew where on earth he was or what, what he was doing, except there was just this constant sort of headache, this, this fear in the back of your head that he could strike anywhere. And that, I remember that, that sense of dread, you know, we all wanted to try to stand on guard against a killer who, who seemed indiscriminate yeah. uh, as far as who he would attack age, neighborhood, men, women, um, he crossed, you know, you know, these supposedly serial killers stick to their own ethnic groups. He didn't. Um, and you know what? He on the night and everybody else had to go to sleep sometime. You yeah. couldn't stay on guard against him. And yeah. uh, if you went to sleep, he would try to get into your dreams. So I thought that helped me come up with the idea of a, of a villain. And I wondered who thrives on creating that atmosphere and how would I portray the, the, the sense of danger that everybody that starts just slowly infiltrating everybody's lives, even, even the people who go to work with a gun on their hip, they start to worry about whether, um, whether they're, they and their families are safe. And then they feel the additional responsibility to try to stop. Of course, I have a killer who's, who's slowly escalating. <laughs> the attacks are coming more quickly. Nobody, uh, you, the, you create the dread by, by, in my case, I put readers occasionally into the killer's uh, point of view. So, the readers are ahead of uh, the the heroes in a sense. They know that uh, the bad guy is uh, planning something tonight and is uh, getting ready to go out and do it. And they they worry like, oh, you know, how are they going to stop? And they they don't know what he's planning. So you 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 keep uh, you keep the 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 good guys as just a step behind most of the time in the story, so that they're always a little bit on the back foot trying to trying to catch up. So that creates an anxiety in the reader's mind, uh, wondering, are they ever going to figure this out? Are they ever going to take that final step and, uh, and put an end to this? So I, I, I find that rewarding as an author. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, Rachel. Um, yeah, I, with, with, with um, all seven of the characters um, who are in the house, each of their situations, like you, Mick, are, are they come from real life uh, examples of, of people being awful. So there's, you know, Miriam with the cyber bullying and there's, you know, Javier, who's a cook who uh, owns a restaurant that sells big, big, big food where they have like 20 stacks of hamburgers. There's a place in Vegas that has stuff like that. And I wanted her though, to be the arbiter of, Dread. No one else thinks they've done anything wrong in their lives. They feel totally justified. And that's why their ends are as quick as they are. With Miriam, though, I wanted her to see, you know, just how sins are repaid with the people around her. And in that, there's this dread she feels that that something is is she here for this reason with this girl who hurt her daughter did, am you know, she wonders, am I a bad mom? Am I not justified? And so I wanted her to feel that. And I wanted the reader to kind of step back and think about all the little hurts they've done to other people. And are those hurts something that would land them in a bad place or in a, in, in purgatory? Because, you know, a lot of times you go through life saying things to people without a second thought and that destroys someone or leads someone to self-harm or, you know, everything we do uh, affects someone else. And that was my point. And in, in, and in doing that, that's, I wanted that kind of self-reflection that Miriam does throughout the book. And she pulls back sometimes saying, you know, I was right in doing what I did, but then something else happens and she, well, maybe I wasn't right. So I wanted more of that self-reflection that has her teeter once again in that, that space of good and evil, to, you know, to see if, you know, is she good? Is she bad? Does she deserve an ending? So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I like those, I like the gray spaces in, in, in everything. I think gray spaces, you get to play a lot. And I think it's a very... Um, 
I don't think anyone's ever a hundred percent good or, or evil. And I hate reading about those types of people, you know, and I think everyone hates reading about those types of, you know, what are they called? Sally Ann's or whatever. They're, Mary Sue's. Mary Sue's. Mary Sue's are, are I, uh, off, yeah. off with their heads with Mary Sue's because no one is like that. We all have our blind spots mm-hmm. and sometimes our blind spots though. Yeah. Very, Miriam becomes such an interesting narrator because she, she is unreliable. I mean, this is again, another cliche, the unreliable narrator, right. but she's, because she has uh, some, a lot of times she has lied to herself about, about the motive of, for, of what she's right. done, but, but she is in purgatory rather than in hell because she can realize that she gets glimpses of, of, of the truth and right. is willing to at least tentatively reach out and touch it and, and, and try to acknowledge it at some point. Right. And even Caitlin, who, you know, if you've read the other two books, you know, she struggled with a, a personal issue um, with the cutting and you think, you know, she's stronger now. She's, she has a, a wonderful lover and her best friend and this great job. And so she should be okay, but she is not okay. And she will never be okay. And that's fine. That makes for a wonderful character. That makes for a wonderful life of this this series because you you worry about her. And, and there is dread as a reader. It's like, is she going to be okay? Because you want her to be okay. I know. Just, yeah. Don't 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 look so worried. I think she's, <laughs> <laughs> she's okay. She's coming Rachel. back for another book. So she's 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 hanging, she's, she's hanging in there. Yeah, but is she getting closer and closer to that point where she, she may not be able to come back for the other book? You know, because she has a lot going on. I mean, all these 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 people that we write about. You know, yes, they're they're make believe, but in some ways, they're they're not. You know, right. because they represent uh, not necessarily people we know, but situations we've all been in where we feel helpless and desperate. And that's my cat going. <laughs> 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 oh, see, he's he's helpless. And desperate and he, wants he has an opinion help. about this. About yeah, certain but characters. that's what really? that's what makes life interesting and scary and, and worth writing about. Yeah, yeah. Now. The two of you are both um, active in Mystery Writers of America with Meg as the president. And Rachel, you've been on the national board. Um, both of you go to a lot of conferences and writing workshops. And, and, and Rachel, I hope Left Coast Crime gives you another chance. <laughs> oh, my God. Because, because so years I was waiting for that. You know, I mean, to be guest of honor and then to have this bloody pandemic that means that... That is my life, though, Lori. That is my life. I, no, I it's, constantly... You get, it, you get another chance. Was, my first book was published on the first anniversary of 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, cool. I'm sorry. Cool. Yeah, so... But, you know, so conferences conferences and workshops and organizations and, and things like that, obviously the two of you both think uh, that these are worth doing and that, but I wonder if you could say a little bit about what you have gotten out of them in the past and why do you continue to, to go to them um, both as uh, community builders and as uh, help for your craft, the craft of writing. Um, Rachel, what to start with you. Um, first, I, I like going to those strictly, in, in some ways, strictly for my own learning. So a lot of these uh, conferences have experts there and, you know, cops and forensic techs and lawyers. And I learn a lot from going and listening to what they have to say about what they do. And I'm listening not just for, you know, what kind of gun you carry, but also what is life like? like from day to day with family, with your body, with your finances, what is it like to be in your shoes? I also go because um, I think there, as although we are getting better in terms of diversity and inclusion, we still have work to do. And by me being there, um, I'm hoping that, you know, people get used to seeing people who don't necessarily look like them or, or, you know, come from where they come from we have something interesting and important to add, especially when it comes to crime and mystery. I mean, a lot of these stories take place in the neighborhoods I grew up in. So if you're writing about 
my hometown, you should be open to me, you know, from that area being in that space. Um, I, I want to uh, represent, especially African Americans and African American women in this, in this space. So, and I also like nice hotel rooms and they tend to be, you know, in hotels and I like staying in them. I don't have to worry about the litter box or, you know, <laughs> dirty sheets or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, conferences. I mean, I had to be convinced and nudged to attend my first BoucherCon, which is the big annual convention. I presume most people who are watching this have, have heard of BoucherCon, the World Mystery Convention. It's a fan convention, and my my publisher strongly encouraged me to attend. And I was okay. Uh, and after I'd been there for a day, I knew that I wanted to come back as often as it was possible to come back because I was with people who had totally given themselves over to the love of the books I love to read and the books I love to write and uh, in investigating, interrogating, discussing. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's mystery camp. <laughs> yeah. You don't feel like weird for writing about murder and death. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and you can all be just as goofy and, and geek out over the books you love and um, uh, like chase an author down a hall <laughs> or or not and try to and, and find a way to connect with other people who are um, other authors. Again, some conferences do offer a lot of craft courses and those are so interesting just to get another writer's perspective on. But I, one of the huge things I learned from going to conferences was to connect with people who are readers because anybody who comes to a book festival or a conference is dedicating their free time to investing in, in the genre, in the, in, the, in the work that we do. There, I'm at, I mean, and you pay attention. These are not just, oh, these are the readers. These are the fans. These, the, they're, you know, how many people I've met who are um, physicians who take their annual vacation, you know, yeah. getting together with a friend <laughs> at, a, at a conference. And, yeah. you know, they're talking about their cardiology practice or, you know, a, a, a school bus driver who, who has been reading mysteries, you know, you know uh, between, uh, between routes for the last 35 years. And you realize how, how wonderful it is to to meet people whose whose day to day lives don't revolve around this the way ours do, but they are, you know, they they are the people that make our work possible because they buy the books. Yeah. So it's wonderful to get together with them. I have so many friends I've made who some are writers, some are, um, you know, people who just attend, and um, it becomes a, a a chance to to. Uh, not indulge, but to immerse yourself fully into um, into what we are lucky enough to do uh, yeah. when we write. Yeah, which I think makes this whole this whole stay at home really much worse because our colleagues, the people that we meet once a year at various <laughs> conferences, are, are now they're not there. We can't go and schmooze and hang around a bar and talk about dead bodies and all the rest of it. We have to sort of deliberately think, Oh, I can meet online with Rachel and Meg and we can talk about dead bodies and everything <laughs> <laughs> and other cheerful conversations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll get you thrown out of normal restaurants, um, right. yes. but not at a conference because it's a conference. So, so, um, so let's, I I'd like to do a quick lightning round. Uh -oh. Okay. 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 Uh, outline or pantser? Outline. Outline. Do you need more than a single word? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've pantsed before and I end up with no pants. <laughs> I <end> up <laughs> <laughs> Pantsless. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just like organization. I, 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 I still work full time and so my time is very limited. And so an outline helps me uh, stay focused. And I can check it off. I like checking things off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Um, drink of choice as you're writing. Coffee. Coffee. Neither of you have a bottle in your desk. Neither no. Uh, I, I, do, I do my, my writing um, in the morning. 
So that was one of my other questions, morning or night? Ah, morning, because I usually write an hour before I start work. So that's why there's the coffee, because it's at six o'clock in the morning. (laughs) Mostly afternoons now. It used to be morning. I used to have a hard uh, deadline for a couple of years when I was... uh, I I was I was at home when the kids got off the school bus, so wow. I always knew that I that if I wanted to do anything, it had to be done by three yeah. fifty three p.m. when the <laughs> corner. But the kids all managed to graduate from high school, so <laughs> I can now <laughs> I can now write until I get hungry <laughs> or my husband gets hungry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I when my kids were small, I used to start a book in September um, because that's oh. when the school year started. Yeah, and it, and it, when they when they stopped, I thought I I, I don't have to wait till the first week of September when they, or last week of August now. But you know, it's amazing how wow. things open up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, music during writing or quiet? Quiet for me. I just want to hear my own thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> Quiet and if I'm going to, I can edit with music, but it has to be usually a soundtrack, uh, something that's got a, an emotional uh, sweep to it, but not lyrics, because otherwise I'll start singing along. Yeah, and <laughs> I'll stand up and I'll start <laughs> waving your hand. Moving around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can transcribe listening or watching TV, but like fresh writing, I I can't do that with sound. Mm-hmm. Maybe so- whale songs or something. I don't know. <laughs> I think I'd fall asleep. Do, uh-huh. I mean, do you find that it's changed over the years? Have you, did you used to be able to write with chaos in the background or no? I think I probably was able to do that, but now not so much. I don't, I like working from home. My husband and I, we, we are both in the living room and he listens to Andy Griffith and paternity court and all this stuff. I'm like, I can't, so I've moved to the dining room because I can't have I can't have all that in my head. I, yeah, yeah. I, I I have a lot of real real trouble with distraction, but but bizarrely, I can work on airplanes. I'm can. not doing that now. Yeah, but I in the airport. Why am I working so well on an airplane? I realized, well, yeah, because I didn't buy the Wi-Fi. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've got, you know, until they tell me to put up the tray table, this is yeah. all I've got to do. It's, it's just sitting there, you know, the cursor's blinking at me, it's staring at me and I, and, and I really get a lot done. Yeah. Yeah. I think, that, I think a lot of it has to do with the demands. Um, Cause I find that if, if I'm focused in on something and I know it needs to get done, I sort of can drop away stuff more easily than mm. yeah. um, when the kids were small, I would write any little corner that, uh, you know, yeah. they'd have a piano lesson and I'd be sitting in the car writing. Uh, that's yeah. soccer practice, which I miss right now. I, that's where I do some writing too. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I can't, I can't uh, read my last writing here. Um, any anything that you guys particularly want to talk about? Um, we have just a couple of minutes left, I think. But um, and I, I have another couple of things. But if there's anything that you are missing, do do you want well, to? I want to know how soon Rachel's next book is, uh, ah! is to shelf so that we can read it. Yay! Uh, my next novel, another standalone. Um, it's titled "And Now She's Gone." Is out September twenty second. It's about um, a young meaning career-wise, young private investigator named Grayson Sykes, who gets her first case. Great name. Thank you. Um, And that's to determine if her her client's girlfriend, Isabel Lincoln, who is missing, does she, is she truly missing or does she just not want to be found? Mm -hmm. So once again, kind of dipping into procedural but not really it's kind of a mix of of, of things so i'm looking forward to that coming out okay Sign and up. what are you working on now i mean if that's coming out in september are you working on the next one? Oh yeah um this is i read a book called i think it was the geographer's library or something like that the, about five ten years ago and so i'm and kind of that inspired me and it's about a young digital archaeologist who works for this um, company called the Memory Bank, where, you know, you upload memories and it's like an Alexa device type thing. 
and she's uploading uh, memories of this old shopkeeper who has secrets. And these memories are not exactly what she thinks they are. So it's um, another darkish story, I would say, probably the darkest one I've written. Okay. Cannot <laughs> wait. Big. Big. I am working on Unsub 4, finishing that up. Uh, the Dark Corners of the Night is Unsub book three and um so i will give the spoiler away that caitlin and her team survive and are will be back in which the books can be read out of order but there are some that they can be i would never tell anybody to to wait to buy one of my books or check it out of the library get it now get it again, <laughs> please but um there are a few threads that uh, that carry over some um, some long running mysteries, and that will uh, that will come up again in uh, on sub four. Great, mm, can't wait. So, thank you, Meg Gardner, Rachel Housel Hall. If you enjoyed this conversation, pop into your local bookshop, actually or virtually, and order a copy of one of their amazing books. And if you'd like to see, there's their books. If you'd like to see more of these events, remember that Mystery Writers of America is the premier organization for writers, both traditionally and self-published, as well as those, affili those in affiliated fields. We have 11 chapters working to empower the professional mystery writers since 1945. And our motto is, crime doesn't pay enough. <laughs> so thank you, Meg Gardner, Rachel Housel Hall. I'm Laurie King, and Mystery Writers of America thanks you also. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Lori.